This video is on A-level PE biomechanics and will be featuring levers, Newton's laws and forces. Lever systems. So we've got two key words here. We've got the origin and the insertion. The origin refers to the non-moving anchor point of the muscle that is causing the movement. So if we look on the diagram, we can see at the top here, we can see the biceps muscle are attached to the scapula. So that's why it's important that we know of these bones near the collarbone, um, and that is the non-moving part of where the muscle is attached. Equally, we've got the insertion, so it's the attachment site where the muscle pulls to cause the movement. So we can see here the biceps are also attached to the lower arm of the radius, and that is where the movement occurs. So when we say do a bicep curl, the biceps contract, pulling upwards in this proximal direction, um, the lower arm. So moving on, we've got three things that we need to really know and understand about lever systems. We've got the fulcrum, the effort and the load. So the fulcrum to start off with, it is the main pivot point that the movement moves around and it's often represented by a triangle as you can see on the diagram on the bottom. We've got the effort, so that is the force applied by the muscles, and that is usually represented as an arrow in the direction that the force is being applied. And we've got the load, so the weight or the object that needs to be moved. Just note that this can also be the weight of the athlete's body themselves, especially, say, when looking at the ankle joints. Um, again, this is represented by an arrow in the direction that the load is applying the force. So, first of all, we can see here that we've got an example of a first class lever. Now, if we draw this diagram on the left, we can see we've got one, two, three at the top and then FLE underneath. So, what this basically means is that if we want a first class lever, our fulcrum is in the middle. If we are looking at a second le class lever, our load is in the middle. And if we're looking at a third class lever, our effort is in the middle. So if we transfer that across to this diagram here, we can see that for our first class lever, our fulcrum is in the middle. If we transfer across to our second class lever, we can see the load is in the middle. And if we go to our third class lever, we can see that indeed the effort is in the middle. Now it's all well and good understanding how that works as a sort of a seesaw diagram, but more importantly, we need to be able to apply that to the body. So we've got a few examples here. We've got our first class lever depicting the neck area uh, with the cranium. So that's the tilting of our head forwards and backwards. We've got our second class lever around the ankle joint, so the gastrocnemius or soleus contracting, our fulcrum at the balls of our feet and the load of our body weight in the middle. And we've got our third class lever just with our bicep curl there, so the load on the end, the effort in the middle and the fulcrum at the end around the elbow joint. So there's also something which we need to look at called mechanical advantage and mechanical disadvantage. So this states that the shorter the effort arm, the less load can be exerted, and the shorter the load arm, the bigger the load can be. So to summarize this, a discus thrower with long arms will be able to throw the discus further than someone with shorter arms, because they'll be able to generate more speed. However, we've got to note that that is only if they were to use the same amount of effort. Equally, a person with shorter arms could lift more weight on the bench press than someone with longer arms using the same amount of effort. Um, the reason being is because they have a shorter load arm and therefore the load can be much larger.
Moving on to Newton's laws. So Newton's laws consists of three laws, first, second, and third. So we'll start off with the first law, and that is basically stating that an object will remain at rest or stationary, or continue moving at constant velocity unless another force changes this. Often, Newton's first law is referred to as the law of inertia, and inertia is sometimes used to represent mass. So if we're looking at this diagram here with the sprinter, moments before he started, he will have been standing still waiting to race. And he wouldn't have been moving because a force would not have caused the body to start moving unless he was applying some sort of force to the floor. Equally, once he's in full flow and he's running quickly, in order to stop, he's also going to have to apply some force in order to stop running. Now, of course, this will be influenced by muscles and things like that, but we could also apply Newton's laws to say objects. So if you have a football, for example, it will remain still until a force moves it. Equally, if you put a football at the top of a hill, it will roll down that hill constantly until a force changes this. Moving on to the second law, the bigger the net force, the greater the acceleration. So what we'll take from that to start off with is the more force that is applied to the floor here, the faster <coughs> or the uh, quicker the sprinter will accelerate. Also, something to note, is the more mass an object has, the less acceleration there is going to be. So if this sprinter was say 20 kilos heavier, his acceleration would be much less. That is why you usually see sprinters with very low body fat, because if they were to say carry more body fat and unusable muscle, they wouldn't be moving as fast as someone else. The equation for working out the second law is F equals M times A, so force equals mass times acceleration. Moving on to the third law, this is the law of action and reaction. So this is when two bodies exert a force on one another and the reaction and action are always equal and opposite. So if we're looking at this kayaker here, she is gonna be putting the oar into the water and pushing against the water that way. The amount of force that she's applying backwards will then be reacted in the opposite direction at exactly an equal amount. And by doing so, that will propel her kayak forwards. Forces and values. So these are just a few things that will be really important for when you're in an exam, just to have a bit of an idea of how it works. So first of all, force, what we've been talking about, that's measured in Newtons and can be abbreviated as an N. A vector is a quantity that has a size and a direction. The direction part of this is the most important thing. So such as a weight, a velocity, acceleration, or a force. A scalar is a quantity that has a size or value only, so no direction. And this could allude to mass, speed, or energy. The last point is gravitational force. Now this is really important for exam questions and you could occasionally get asked a three mark question on this. So gravity has um, a force of 9.81 newtons per one kilogram of weight. So it's important to remember that say, if we were trying to work out what a 70 kilogram person applies to the ground when standing still, we times 70 kilos, the weight of the person, by 9.81 newtons, and that would give us 686.7 newtons of force being applied to the earth when standing still. You could get asked a three mark question, as I mentioned in this, so you'll get the marks for the calculation, you'll get the mark 
for the correct unit, so using newtons in your response, and you will also get a mark for the correct answer after the calculation.